দেশের যে সম্ভাবনা যেখানে এআই ডেটা সায়েন্স নিয়ে যেতে পারে যাওয়া দর উচিত বাংলাদেশ সেটা ডিজার্ভ করে তো আমরা আমাদের অল্প একটু যে লার্নিং হয়েছে সেগুলো আমরা শেয়ার করব কাজ করে আমাদেরটা global scale impact create korte parbo so shekhan theke basically ajke amader ei session ta amra arrange kora amra basically ajke session ta ke tin ta segment e bhag korechi prothomote amader je jini special guest kian katan purush uni prothome eshe amader sathe owner experiences gulo owner ideas gulo amader sathe share korben we can see kian with us kian hello thank you so much for joining uh, 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 everyone uh, say hello to kian amra shobai kian ke let's uh, welcome him on the chat thread and jodi karo kichu specifically bolar thake to kian we can share that as well in the thread uh, to everyone uh, so kian we are, i was just sharing uh, with everyone uh, the 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 uh, format for today's uh, event so first up we will uh, like to hear from you in the first segment uh, your experiences how you uh, what would be your guidelines for young talents from bangladesh uh, in the second segment we will basically take a few questions from from all the panelists and attendees and then uh, we'd, we'd love to hear your thoughts on those questions and on the third segment we will uh, hear from some of our local talents their experiences into the world of ai and data science and uh, with that we'll wrap up to our, our today's presentation uh, so first of all uh, i'd like to g- give a little bit of introduction about kian although he needs no introduction he is one of a uh, global thought leader in the space of ai and data science uh, uh, he uh, currently is a lecturer of computer science at uh, stanford university and he's also a co-founder of workera.ai uh, workera uh, for those of you uh, us who, uh, that don't know about workera it's industry's leading assistant platform in the space of ai and data science and it also uh, provides curated learning guides whoever wants to uh, explore their potentials in the space of ai and data science uh, he's also a founding member at deeplearning.ai uh, so uh, if everything is all right uh, from kian from your end uh, we'd like to hear from you in the first segment of our uh, today's event over to you kian Thank you Inam and hi everyone. I hope uh, the day has been good and your week is off to a good start. Um I'm very excited to to be speaking with you all and uh, and I wanted to make sure we we try to make the session as interactive as possible. So I'm going to go on the chat and say uh, hi everyone. And if you're here, please answer so that we can use the chat when we when we discuss all together. Hi Zubai, hi Rafi, hi Tanzin, hi Mashur, hi Khalid, hello everyone, hi Zoha, hi Kazi, great, 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 hi Sheikh, hi Munim, good, good, super. Well, in the meantime, I'm also going to share my screen. Uh, I wanted to share a few slides with you. Okay. 
Here we are. So be before we start, and I have the chat open, so if there is any question, please don't hesitate to write it directly on the chat. Um, I'm very excited to, to speak today. Um, we've been preparing this with, with Oli and the Intelligence Machines team uh, for a while. And I think that um, uh, the idea here is to share a little bit of trends around AI and data careers, but also give the opportunity to all of you to ask questions if you're building up your AI career and you're wondering what may be the next step. Okay, so don't hesitate to, to ask questions. Uh, before we start, the, the first thing I wanted to, to say is uh, that you may have noticed that we are in a new age right now. And when you look at the headlines uh, in journals, you would see that every company is transforming. You have healthcare companies, for those of you who like healthcare, who are transforming into data companies. You have agriculture or farming companies that are becoming robotics companies. And you even have uh, automotive companies that are becoming either renewable energy companies or sometimes even software companies. And I'm not even talking about telcos who are also becoming media and data companies. And so every industry in the way we knew it a hundred years ago has changed recently or is changing into something completely new. And these transformations are all centered around the power of data. And for that reason, uh, uh, um, AI uh, and, and associated with that is the rapid progress of data and AI. So when you look specifically at data and AI, you realize that these companies and these industries cannot really keep up with the pace of progress if they're not reinventing their skills. Because in AI, the half-life of skills is a great indicator of how fast the, 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 the industry is moving. This indicator essentially is telling us how long will a skill be relevant to our careers, to our jobs, and generally uh, to, to building applications. If you take a skill like matrix multiplications or linear algebra, it is an example of a skill that has a very long half-life. So I'm, I'm ready to bet that five years from now, 10 years from now, we will still need linear algebra to be a successful data scientist. On the other hand, you have skills like TensorFlow or PyTorch, which are changing very rapidly. Um, the TensorFlow I was using in 2015 is, is, is very different from the one that we're using today. And it has changed a lot. And it's probably very much easier and with a lot of capabilities that have been added. And so AI as a field is moving extremely rapidly. And the last eight years is a testament to it. So if we look at what happened since 2014, we realized in 2014, object detectors like the YOLO series or the RCNN series took over and were very performant. In 2015, you had modern deep learning frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow who took the lead over older frameworks. In 2016, you had the seminal paper from um, uh, Goodfellow et al. on generative adversarial networks, which changed the type of approaches that we take to gen generative modeling. And then more recently, you may have heard of the transformer architecture, which led to massive language models uh, being trained on massive data sets and applied to natural language processing, but also beyond. In 2018, responsible AI, being able to discuss AI fairness, safety, reliability, transparency, privacy, became very prominent in the community. And a lot of large companies are very interested nowadays into responsible AI as they're deploying their AI system. And to deploy their AI system, they need a suite of tools. And this is why you may have seen the rise of many machine learning ops tools that are helping practitioners deploy and maintain their models in production effectively. And most recently, if you've listened to Andrew Eng, you may have heard him talk about data-centric AI, which is an approach around 
uh, fixing the model and tweaking the data in order to improve the performance of an AI system, which is also a hot topic. But who knows what's going to happen in the next two, three years? The field is moving so fast. And the only way, and that's our conclusion from this slide, to, 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 to keep up is if we can continuously reskill and stay relevant. And I often say that the companies that uh, will keep up with the progress and the change and stay relevant are those who have the highest learning velocity, those who are investing heavily in their team members and are interested in seeing them reinvent themselves constantly. And so for today, we'll, we'll split uh, the discussion in three parts. I first talk about how this rapid progress in AI has an impact on how AI careers are shaped. Uh, I'll also talk about how companies are structuring AI teams. And finally, we will do an interactive case study together on the chat. And so get ready for that, where we will think about certain AI applications that we can deploy. OK? Sounds good? Super. Then let's start with AI careers. So regarding AI careers, before even we understand AI careers, I, I'd like to look at a proxy, which is a career type that is much more mature, and that's software. Software uh, is a pretty mature job category, meaning uh, um, when, you, when you think about a software team, you know already that there are certain people that are called backend engineer, there are certain front-end engineers, there are also mobile engineers, DevOps engineer, and you can give me the full list of engineers that you can think of. It was not the case 30, 40 years ago where software was a super specialized skill that only certain people that are computer scientists will have. Nowadays, the teams are much more structured and there are much more people that specialize in software. And so as a job category, software is much more understood than AI. AI in comparison is still nascent. And it is still not fully clear how to build an effective AI team. But companies have been trying many things. Oftentimes, people think about AI as only modeling. But the life cycle of an AI system is much more than modeling. I really like this little chart uh, who was uh, I, I borrowed from Google's paper on hidden technical depth in machine learning systems that is linked at the bottom of the slide. And it shows you how machine learning code, which is the little dark box in the middle, is only a small piece of the puzzle when you deploy an AI system. There's so much more that is involved in deploying an AI system, and you need to be aware, at least aware, literate, or fluent about all these pieces, even if you're not a specialist. Andrew and I have spent a significant amount of time trying to understand what are AI projects? Like, what are the tasks that they involve? What are the skills that are needed in those tasks? And then also, what are the career types that we find most commonly in those AI teams? And so these are five master tasks that you would find in most AI projects. Data engineering, of course, the action of preparing the data, modeling, the building the models, tweaking them, fine tuning them, optimizing them. Deployment, which is the task of making those models available to the end users and the customers. And then business analysis, which is the, the answer to the question, is the model bringing any tangible value to the business or the task that you were trying to achieve? And then in the middle, you have AI infrastructure tasks, which are usually present in more mature teams. So you can think of how a team can share computational resources effectively. You can think about how teams can share their models. Maybe one team has built a model that can be used on another application and fine-tuned. This would be called a model zoo. There is maybe a data version control in place so that we understand how the data varies over time and we can version control it. All of that are tasks that fall under AI infrastructure and are meant to make the entire team more effective. So more effectively, uh, jumping from other task to other task. And sometimes, for example, on LinkedIn, you would see that machine learning is called a skill. 
that you can recommend to someone. But if someone tells you machine learning is a skill, I would tell them, uh, tell them no, uh, machine learning is not a skill. It's hundreds of skills, maybe thousands of skills. Because when we dig into machine learning on the job, we realize that it's not a skill, it's a domain. It's a domain that breaks down into subdomains. You need to understand the machine learning models. You need to understand the methods to train them. You need to understand how to strategize on machine learning projects. These subdomains break down into topics, into subtopics, all the way down into skills. And what you should be interested in as a practitioner is, or non-practitioner is how can I evaluate my skills? And I, I want to know at a granular level what I have, what I don't have, so that I can effectively upskill and focus on my gaps. And so always think about machine learning as hundreds of skills, not a single skill. And this has also been done. This is an example of a competency model or a snapshot of a competency model that you can find on Workera. And it has already been done also for non-practitioners. What I mean by non-practitioners are Many of you, many of us are people that want to be involved with AI. We interface with data scientists and machine learning engineers or software engineers, but we are not the ones coding. And we are uh, uh, maybe the people that are trying to support in various ways the technical functions. Well, if you're in that category, you can also see the competency models that have been developed for you to be more literate and fluent about AI. For example, communicating about AI, understanding what is AI-based, what is not an AI system, understanding who does what in an AI team. And so these are also very important topics to think about for your team. And so as we said, why software has been specializing more over the years, AI has also been specializing more. This is a career type that we commonly see in the industry. And it's also the career type that um, a lot of the engineers and scientists that, uh, at intelligence machines are focused on. Um, and, and Oli has been working on that, uh, where you have a set of core foundations that include skills that are broadly applicable to many projects. So for example, you need to be able to write algorithms as a data scientist or a machine learning engineer, whether you are in NLP or in speech or in other application areas. And then once you have this set of foundations, you may also need a certain depth. For example, some of you have a depth in computer vision. You need to know a little bit more about transformers. You need to know about pruning and quantizing if you're deploying on edge. Uh, some of you may have a depth in imaging. You know, maybe you need to know about data augmentation methods applied to imaging. Uh, maybe you need to know about convolution neural networks, which are very popular for imaging and attention-based mechanisms. And so this is a type of career that we call pie shape because it has the form of a pi, the number pi. So when you think about your career, try to think, do I have the foundations and am I able to delve into depth as well for my projects? There is one category of practitioners that I wanna call out because it's a very important one in the industry. And I think that's very much the direction the industry is taking. But it is also a T-shape or pie-shape category, but the depth is a certain domain expertise. So here's how I would introduce AI plus X practitioners. Um, Andrew and I are teaching a, a graduate class in the computer science department at Stanford, and you have a picture here on this slide. What we do typically every quarter is we poll the class to understand where are you coming from? What is your background? Which major are you following at Stanford? And you can see on this poll, that 67% of our students are not from the computer science department. Only a third of them are from the computer science department. They're from every lab across campus that you can imagine. Some of them are mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, material scientists, aerospace, aeronautics, chemical, business, law, and healthcare. Um, and I find this wonderful because it creates diversity in the class. But the most important piece is that even if their background is not in computer science or AI, they are very successful in their projects. And let me tell you why. If you look at this example, students uh, uh, and, and, and uh, student researchers were trying to build a pneumonia detector on a chest X-ray. And when they look at the X-ray, because they have background in healthcare, they quickly understand what are the parts 
of the image that the model will need to focus on? What are the edge cases that the model should be careful about? Who are the stakeholders that we need to talk to in order to make sure that this is successfully deployed? What is the clinical environment looking like? And are there any regulations that we should keep in mind regarding the metrics we will use to evaluate this model, for example? Those are questions that I cannot answer because I do not have the background in healthcare, but they were very effective at it. And they've been very successful at their projects. And this is the case across every domain expertise. So if you have a domain expertise, my advice would be not to try to completely shift to AI and abandon it, especially if you have a passion for it, but try to combine AI skills with your domain expertise and you will become an AI plus X practitioner and you will have a unique blend of skills that very few people in the world have and you'll be suited to solve some of the most you know, pressing projects uh, out there. So this was the part on AI curious and we'll get back to it uh, in, in the Q&A if there is any questions. Um, but I'd like to take a minute to talk about AI organizations because we talked about how rapidly AI is evolving as a field. This has also an impact on, on, on organizations because when we talk to organizations, they want to transform to data and AI. And a transformation can only happen successfully if it's a company-wide effort. You cannot expect only 10 people in the company to transform and the entire company to suddenly magically transform. So leaders uh, are looking at it holistically. They're looking at deploying a center of excellence. Those are highly qualified practitioners in AI. They may be called data scientists, machine learning engineers, data engineers, software engineers, data analysts. And they're the top practitioners in the company that are also responsible for educating other people. There is a large group of AI plus X individuals this depends on different companies. So in an automotive companies, you would find a lot of mechanical engineers, you would find a lot of electrical engineers, you would find a lot of propulsion and engineers and energy people, which are AI plus X practitioners. And the two other groups that I'd like to mention are AI and data fluent and AI and data literate people. These are actually probably the most critical group as part of the transformation. And a lot of transformation will fail because Companies have been able to deploy a center of excellence to teach AI plus X folks, but they're struggling to drive fluency and literacy across the company. If you want to know who may be fluent, well, in the fluency group, I would say this is anyone who is interfacing with uh, AI or data practitioners. They may be business leaders that are trying to put together AI strategies. They may be uh, product managers, project managers, program managers that are managing uh, technical teams and scheduling and building up the processes around them. They need to understand what a data project lifecycle looks like because it's very different from a software project. In AI, for example, sometimes it's hard to predict if you meet a deadline. It's hard because you are optimizing for a certain metric and it's less predictable than other job categories open time. Um, you can think of a recruiter that is trying to uh, um, uh, talk to data scientists, present them the projects of the company, or even understand the skill set of the candidate. But if they do not speak the same language, they will not be successful as a recruiter. And so this is another category that needs to be fluent. And then in the literacy, I would say it's anyone who is interfacing with the technology itself, anyone who needs in their job to be able to work alongside an AI system or a smart system, and they need a fair bit of vocabulary to interact with it. And so this is what we call company-wide uh, transformation framework, and, and it's a pyramid. Um, and then when you look at all these, uh, you can start, and that's part of what uh, my team at Workera does, helping leaders build pathways for their workforce so that the workforce can understand what is the cover that I'm in today, what are the skills that I need to develop over time to be aligned with the needs of the company and the needs of the projects that I need to build. And so these are examples of pathways that people have built. Uh, Oli and I have worked on many pathways for the intelligent machines team. And, and here you have examples of AI plus X, data scientists, machine learning pathways, where we start with a core and then we dig deeper into specialties depending on who needs what for their projects. 
And these pathways are skills-based, meaning they're defined with target scores that are calibrated psychometrically. They are not content lists because it doesn't work to ask everybody in a workforce to take the same course and suddenly magically uh, acquire the skills that they exactly need. So this is meant to keep the plan adaptive and let people take tests in order to graduate from each of these blocks and then get personalized learning plans in order to optimize for the score that they're trying to achieve. And so we talked a little bit about AI organization and the pyramidal framework. And for the rest of the conversation, I want to uh, take a moment uh, to build a few AI applications with you. Um, I prepared a few case studies. And so let me share my screen on another presentation. Can you see my other screen? Yeah, okay, thank you. Right. Super. So actually, let's go on the chat, everyone. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, what, did, what did you have for breakfast today? It's a very simple question. It's going to be the simplest question that I will ask, I promise. Uh, bread and eggs only. Okay, super. Fair dose. Egg and rice, bread and eggs, a lot of bread and a lot of eggs. Omar, oats and eggs. Okay, great. Afi, pasta, amazing. Chicken and bread for Baha. Maisha, a burger. She joined us. Cornflakes, I love cornflakes as well. Biscuit and banana, oats. Okay, mango, mango. I, I've seen several mangoes. I, I love mango as well. Great, great, great. Bread, egg, and tea. Yeah. Any coffee drinker? No? <laughs> Bread and mango. Super. Well, I wonder, maybe in, in Dhaka, mangoes are famous, or uh, in Bangladesh, I, I, you probably have great mangoes. Uh, I love mangoes. Uh, cookies and fruits. Okay. That's Sabir, Ibne. You, Ibne Anis, you said coffee as well. Okay, so there's a few coffee drinkers. Okay, espresso, espresso, latte, all sorts of coffees. Okay, black coffee, Fahad. Great. Well, super. Uh, so keep the chat open because we're going to use the chat now. Okay. So in the next, let's say, 15, 20 minutes, um, what I wanted to do is to go through uh, actual examples of AI projects uh, that Andrew and I have worked on and uh, break them down, simplify them, so that we, we try to condense a lot of the learnings we've had and uh, develop uh, uh, stories, project stories that you can reuse when you're on your own projects. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is because one of the most useful thing to me when I work on AI project is to have a portfolio of projects in my mind that I remember, because I remember which technique to work in which scenario and I can apply it to that new project. And so I want you to develop a same portfolio, you know, at work, it's, whether it's in AI, data, software, any topic, try to always have this portfolio in mind because your learnings are valuable. And there is one specific skill that I want to talk about today. It's decision-making skills. And those are skills that are important for technical practitioners, but also for non-practitioners. And you will see why these case studies have involved both people and both people were needed in order to successfully make the system work. So we'll pose an AI problem, we'll break it down into, into smaller, easier pieces, and we'll also talk about training and loss strategy. These are the three case studies that we have for today, day and night classification, trigger word detection, which is my favorite. And if we have time, maybe face verification as well. Okay, so let's start with our first case study. Open the chat because I'm going to ask a question right now. Imagine that you're given an image and you want to classify it automatically with a model as the image was taken during the day, label zero, or the image was taken during the night, label one. My question for you is what data do you collect to solve this problem? How much data do you collect? And are there any specificities about the data you collect that we need to be careful of? So please jump on the chat and tell me your thoughts. Uh, 
A uh, good point. Oli, you're asking. We we want to know is there a, a, a shadow in the image? That's a good question. It has an influence maybe on the amount of data that we wanna that we wanna capture. What else? Raki Buzaman, you're saying, oh, the season when this photo was taken. Okay, so I guess what you're, what you're saying, Raki Buzaman, is, is you need to have enough distribution of pictures, some in winter, some in summer, some in spring, some in fall. Yes. Um, Tamjid, you're saying sky is blue. Yeah, color may be important. So you're saying probably color images because the sky is blue and it can be an important feature. Uh, and Anna. You're saying, is the image taken in a closed space? Because in a closed space, it will be more difficult. I agree. That's a very good point. Um, OK, Mohammed, you're saying mix images of indoor and outdoor. Outdoor may actually be much easier than indoor. That's my guess for the model. Um, Fahad, natural light and artificial lights. Yeah, not, artificial light can be a trick because it's, it may not be the day, but there is artificial light, and, and you confuse the model. That's a very good point. Um, OK, the brightness. So Taufir, you're saying maybe we have a model that takes into account how much brightness there is. And we use that as a, as a, as a way to predict if it's the day or the night. A lot of people here, Rafi, Mustafiz, Nafiz, you're talking about brightness as well. Luminosity, color of the object, temperature, uh, the weather. Yeah. What else? Can you think about edge cases? Like, What are pictures that you think are going to be very hard for the, for the, for the model to, to, to classify? Okay, blurry picture, Oli, yeah. Image of skyline, cloudy, cloudy is hard. Cloudy is very hard, yeah. What else is hard? We said indoor, yeah, Fahim. Indoor is hard, very hard. What else? Are there moments of the day that it may be more uh, ambiguous? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ghazi, you're, you're good, yeah. yeah. I think images of dusk and dawn, yeah, sunrise, sunset, those are hard uh, times. There is a definition for day and night, so we can we can comply with the definition of day and night. Um, the same we, we can say the same we use for star is the is the is the is the day and night uh, separation. So we can find a, a definition, um, but those are great ideas. And now I just want you to tell me how much data points do you need. I'm going to make it simpler. I'm going to say uh, a few words, but. Um, the, this project can become very complex very quickly, depending on what's the scope. If the deployment environment is indoor, it's going to be very hard. If the deployment environment is outdoor, it's probably easier. So uh, let me tell you a few things on top of what you already said. Um, uh, all of that is, is clear, but even a harder edge case is actually my picture currently. Um, if, if, if you look at me right now, can you, do you think it's day or night in my, in my time zone? Morning, okay, so it's the, it's the day, you're, you're right, yeah. You're all right, it's day. Why do you know that it's the day? Uh, uh, probably because one, uh, you know as a human that uh, I would be sleeping maybe if it was the night. You also know by looking at the background that there is some light on the top left. Uh, and you maybe uh, see a window here, and you know that a window is giving uh, outdoor. Uh, and so you have a lot of context, but this is very hard for the model to understand. It's called, uh, there is an entire field called imitation learning that is trying to take all the uh, knowledge that a human has and put it in a task so that the model understands. But imagine how many images you would need to make the model understand that when it's indoor, it has to look at a corner to see if there is a window and look if the window has light or is dark. This would take a lot of images, right? Even harder, maybe there is a clock on my screen. Maybe you would have a clock. And as a human, you just read the clock. It's written 3 p.m. in the afternoon and you can say it's the day. Imagine how much it would take to teach that to the model. It's much more harder than, than if we were outdoor and there will be light everywhere because it needs some level of context that it doesn't have. So. For the sake of simplicity, let's say that we are outdoor, and I'm asking you how many images do you think we need? Do you need five images? Do you need 10 images? Do you need a thousand, a million, 10 million, 100 million? What's your guess? Just give me a guess. And there is no perfect answer, right? I will tell you my opinion after, but, but uh, I want to know what people think. So Rashid, you're saying 2,000. 
Uh, Mustafi is similar to Rashid, around a thousand, um, thousand, fifty thousand for Tanzim, Afzal as well, Rafi a thousand, a hundred thousand for Fahim Mahmoud, ten k, a hundred k. Okay, a lot of uh, okay, Tanzim a million. Okay, it's going up. It's going. <laughs> We're playing the price is right, <laughs> but um, good, good. Around five k with two k each class. So I like what you're saying, Ahnaf. Is you want enough images of day and night. You don't want too many day or too many night. You want a good balance. Uh, I agree. Ten k Adal and Baha as well. Uh, even distribution of ten k images. So. My guess is what I'm seeing here is nobody's saying five images. So uh, we're between a thousand and a million, roughly. That's the range that we're looking at. There is no correct or bad answer. What I would do is I would settle on 10,000 images uh, before I start building the project um, for, fair, for two reasons, mainly. One is I don't want to spend too long on data, on, on data collection without having tested a model. I would rather get a little bit of data than try testing, and then I will see if I'm hitting the numbers that I wanted to hit in terms of accuracy. And then I will see if uh, improving the model is, is more sensitive to bringing more data or other approaches. But 10,000 um, is, is a good number. The reason I take 10,000 is because I have a proxy project in mind. I remember working on a cat classifier where I was trying to find if on an image there is a cat or not a cat. And I sort of remember how many images it took to make the model work at a reasonable level of accuracy. And cats are sneaky. Cats can hide behind cars. And, uh, and so cat classification is probably harder than outdoor uh, classification of day and night. So that is used as a proxy project. But you could do a million. Another reason why I would just settle on 10,000 is because I can probably get 10,000 labeled images in one hour. I will go on uh, Pixabay or one of these websites of images online. I will write a Python script and I will download day pictures and night pictures. So I would, I would type the keyword day and I would download uh, 5,000 pictures and then I would type the keyword night and I would download 5,000 pictures. Uh, you would say maybe because their search is not perfect, there will be mislabeled data. Of course they will. But it's, my guess is it's not going to be a big deal. It's not going to be too much. Uh, the second thing is uh, be careful of the licenses, of course. Pixabay is nice because you can specify the license and you can get CC by images, license-free images that you can use for your models. But always careful with, with Google search. Um, and so we talked about the split and the data distribution. I think people have brought very good points. What is the input of the model? The input is fairly simple. It's an image. Uh, and the big question for me uh, is what is the resolution of the image? Why does that matter? The resolution matters because if you tell me we're using super high resolution images, uh, I would tell you it has computational costs. It has memory costs. It has the cost of your iteration cycle being slower. Uh, um, and, on, and, and maybe it's not even helpful. Maybe there's just too much information on the image. We didn't need that much information. And so how are you going to quickly in an hour figure out what is the a good resolution to, to set for the entry point of your model? And tell me on, on the chat, actually, what is your gut feeling about the, the resolution? What, what should be the resolution? Should it be uh, 500 by 500 by three? Should it be 1,000 by 1,000 by three? Should it be lower? Okay, Mohammed, you're saying 512 by 512. Uh, Kazi, you're going lower. You're saying 20, 225 by 225. Okay. What else? Other ideas? Okay. We're in the same range with Fahim and Tanzim. 250, 250 for Arif. In Tesham, 300, 300. Okay. So Rashid, you're saying 512 by 512 by 3. So you're telling me color matters. So your gut feeling is we need three channels, RGB, and we should not get rid. Should, we should not convert our pictures to grayscale because there's meaningful information. I agree with you. I think color is important. And in fact, even if grayscale would diminish by a factor of three, the size of the image, it's not worth it because colors matter. Um, okay, 512. Okay, good good ideas here. Let me tell you what I think. Actually, I think 64 by 64 by three. So I go, I go much lower. Uh, how do I get there? Um, uh, as I said, we have only one hour. So you could 
do that computationally. You could train your model on different levels of resolution by resizing the images in the input of the model and then determine how much accuracy we get and do a trade-off analysis with the costs that you spend. But even simpler, we need to be um, we need to be very scrappy in AI. So what we did in this project is we literally printed papers of pictures at different levels of resolution and we showed it to humans. We went uh, in Palo Alto and we showed uh, different resolution and we asked people, can you tell me if it's the day or the night? And we quickly realized that anything above 64 by 64 was super easy, like super, super easy. If you go beyond, below 30 by 30, which is slightly harder, then you start seeing people being confused and, and getting it wrong. And so to me, 64 by 64 by three was enough. There's enough information in the picture to say it's the day or the night for my application. And so I will just settle with that. And when you collect your data, you can, you, you can uh, uh, ignore the size of the pictures because you can put as an input to your model a resizing. So you resize automatically all the pictures and then it streams in your model, okay? So just to say that the, the quick experiment with humans is, is important. The output of the model is zero or one. It's a binary classifier. The last activation, what do you think is going to be the last activation of the model? The function at the end of the model that we'll, that we'll put uh, there, if it's a binary classification. Yeah, Shuvo, you're right. Okay, people are, are, are on it here. Are very aware. Sigmoid is a good one. It, it takes a number between minus infinity and plus infinity and it casts it between zero and one so that it can be interpreted as a probability. It's probably the activation that we will use here. Um, I agree. And then the architecture, maybe you will use a convolutional neural network, which seems to be uh, the, the type of network that will work better on imaging here. Don't worry if you don't understand convolutional neural networks. It's something that you can learn actually on, on Workera. And, and online. And the loss function, we will be using most likely a binary cross entropy loss, uh, which is a very common loss for binary classification. But don't worry if you're not aware of that loss function. It's, a, it's an important one to know. Um, OK, so this was our easy warm up. It was our first case study. And we discussed a lot about the data and the strategy that we have around the data. And you can see that some of those are not only for technical practitioners. If you're a non-technical practitioner, non -practitioner, you can still have those conversations with data scientists and, and, and have a meaningful input uh, when you understand at a high level how data and AI projects work. So the summary of our learnings is uh, use a proxy project all the time. And also don't hesitate to go out of the building and test uh, with human experiments certain things that you want to un uncover. The second case study, which is uh, uh, my, my, my favorite, is, um, is a slightly more complicated. Uh, so it's a good step up from the first one. And uh, we call it trigger word detection. The goal is that we're given a 10 second audio speech and we want to detect the word activate. So maybe you have seen some virtual assistants like, okay, Google, uh, Alexa, uh, Nihao Baidu, Cortana, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that activates on a certain word. Our word is the word activate, okay? And so we're trying to build that model that detects the word activate, but doesn't detect other words. So first question for you is the same as before. How are you gonna collect the data? What are you gonna collect? How much data are you gonna collect? What's the distribution? Tell me more. Oli, you're saying ambient noise. So background noise, number of speakers, yeah. Any other ideas? 50,000 audio clips for Tassadir. Oh, Oli, you're saying dialects. Yeah, so one thing that is very important here is you want to have enough variety of frequencies. And Kazi, you're saying as well, uh, data from both male and female. Uh, uh, Raki Buzaman, you're saying age of the speaker. Uh, uh, of course, those are very important topic. And actually, the first time I, I built that model, uh, the first iteration did not work well on my German friends. My German friends were telling me it doesn't, it doesn't activate when we say activate. So we had to fuel more data into the training process and, and then uh, uh, fix that. Uh, okay, window size. So Zubair, you, Zubair you're already thinking about, uh, about the, the model and the window size. Uh, and that's a good point. High pitch, low pitch, accent noise. Okay, those are great ideas, Mustafiz, Nushin. 
Okay, different background noises and environment, Rashid, you're right. Eight to 10,000 clips. Okay, different devices. That's a good point, Homera. Good, good, good. Those are great ideas. So let me let me tell you a little bit uh, about how we did it. There, there is no, again, perfectly correct answer, but there are certain things that are important. So let's say that we have collected a bunch of 10 second audio clips. I'll get back to how we collect it later. Um, the distribution, we go by what you said, enough frequencies, enough age range, enough gender range, enough uh, uh, accents ranges. We, we take care of all of that and enough positive and negative words. Positive word is activate, negative word is any other word that we do not want to detect. So enough of both. And the input to the model is something like this. It's a 10 second audio clip that has a background in, in a orange that has some positive words. The, the green is the positive word. Positive word means activate, it's the word activate. And some purple words, which are negative words. Any other words, lion, kitchen, rainbow, anything, bed, anything. And uh, the resolution, you know, maybe we don't know because it's our first speech project. My advice for the resolution is to not try to reinvent the wheel. There's plenty of experts on speech that have worked on speech systems. And if you go on GitHub today, you will find many speech projects. You can open the GitHub repository. You can look at the sample rate that they use and you can use the same. It's very common actually to use a certain sample rate for human frequencies, okay? So don't try to tune it. Just, just uh, defer to the expert advice and use it. And of course, uh, 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 cite the work of the researchers that have done the experiment, but you don't need to reinvent the wheel. The output of the model, what do you think is going to be the output? Tell me on, tell me on the chat, what's, what's, the, what's the output? Zero or one, okay, binary classification, Muhammad as well, you're saying. Okay, 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 binary classification. So what I want to do now is to test out if this is a good strategy together. In order to test out if this labeling scheme is good for training, we are going to do an experiment. So this experiment is with three audio clips. Um, I want you to think like you are the machine learning model. You are the machine learning model. You have no context. You just have three audio clips and the three audio clips are labeled. So the only thing you know is the first audio clip has the word, the second doesn't have the word, and the third one has the word. I'm not telling you what the word is, but it's not activate. I changed the word just for the purpose of the experiment. So uh, try to guess what the word is. Okay, listen. Maria, è ora di andare a scuola. Ti passo a prendere quel tuo pomeriggio. Second one. Giocato a calcio sabato sera con gli amici. È stato divertente, ma abbiamo perso. And third one, which also has the word. Che cosa fai questo pomeriggio? Potrei andare a fare shopping oppure vado a fare la spesa? Okay, go on the chat and tell me what's the word. Nature, nature, shopping, nature, nature, interesting. No, no. That's not the word. Nobody found the word yet. On, I, I chose on purpose a language that, that uh, I don't speak, uh, it's Italian. Um, and, 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 and it's fair because the model doesn't speak our language. So if we're the model, we're not supposed to speak the language. Um, it was not English, uh, Adi. Esperada, okay, Gazi, you're trying something. No, no. We'll hear again, but but uh, I, I what I see is it's very hard, and and don't worry, it's hard, it's very hard. It's normal that you don't find the so so the conclusion that I want to make here is if we use this labeling scheme, the model will probably not guess it after three uh, iterations. It, it's just too hard. It's just not possible. Uh, now I'm going to suggest a new labeling scheme. Okay, and we're going to redo the experiment one more time. So listen carefully and try to find the word. This is our new labeling scheme. Maria, è ora di andare a scuola. Ti passo a prendere quel tuo pomeriggio. Giocato a calcio sabato sera con gli amici. È stato divertente, ma abbiamo perso. 
Che cosa fai questo pomeriggio? Potrei andare a fare shopping oppure vado a fare la spesa? Okay, what is the word? Marijo. Okay, we're getting closer. Nushin, you're saying Marijo. No, no, I still don't see it. Meiji. Okay, okay, Zibon. I, I see some people are getting parts of the word, but that's I still don't see the word. Okay, Zubair, something that finishes by Joe. Yeah, that's that's the word actually, but it's 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 something longer than Joe. Region, no. So Meja, okay, okay, we're getting closer. So so some people are getting pieces of the word. Um, the point I want to make here is you can see that the second labeling scheme is much easier to learn the trigger word. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that if I give you two more, you will probably find the word. Uh, but you will not find it if I give you two more with the first labeling scheme. It's just too complicated. The word was this one. The word was pomeriggio, which is the Italian word for afternoon. It means afternoon. Um, and uh, <laughs> and I see everyone was like that <laughs> during the, the, the training process. But um, so what 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 is our learning here? Our learning is the labeling process is extremely important. Um, and one thing that I believe in is, I believe that with the first labeling process, it will take a hundred X, maybe a thousand X more data to learn the same amount as with the second labeling process. So if I think about what will make this project successful, it is definitely the labeling process. It's more impactful than tweaking your model. It's more impactful than many other approaches. And so this is something that you can identify now that you have a proxy project, maybe on your own projects. Um, so now you may tell me, uh, okay, but uh, it's very costly to label like that. Like, you know, it seems very complicated. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, our output is going to be uh, this sequence of zeros and ones where the one is indicative of the position of the trigger word. Uh, one other uh, uh, trick uh, about uh, this sequence is there's a lot of zeros. So you can actually get 99% confidence uh, uh, with only predicting zeros, which is a problem. It means one, accuracy is not the right metric to use. You cannot use just zero one accuracy metrics. Uh, and two, you may uh, uh, bias your model toward predicting zero too much. So one thing you can do is to use many ones. So when you see the trigger word, instead of putting one one for one time step, you just put more ones uh, so that you balance a little bit. It's an engineering trick, simply an engineering trick. Uh, the last activation, we're going to use sigmoid, but we're going to use sequential sigmoid, one per time step. At every time step, we want to make a prediction between zero and one. Do we think the trigger word was just said or not? And then architecture. Um, something that was mentioned earlier is we want a sort of a window that is scanning so we can use either a recurring a recurrent neural network or a convolutional neural network that scans. Uh, and, and that may be the good way to approach it. There are many other architectures, but I don't want to go into the details of that right now. And the loss function, if we're doing a sequential binary classification, then we will use a sequential uh, binary cross-entropy. Okay, so what was critical to the success of this project? It was really the data labeling strategy and collection strategy. So here is how we did it and why it was very powerful. We split our data into three databases. The green one is the positive words, so activate. The pink one is the negative words and the, the brown one is the background noise. Background noise is very easy to find. Actually, remember in your speech project, background noise is almost free. You can literally download any license-free video. You extract the sound and you use that as background noise. In one day, you can have millions and millions of background noises. So no problem with that one. We take our data and we and we take 10 seconds of the background noise. Um, um, the positive words, the trick that we use is that instead of collecting 10 second audios, we went with our smartphones around campus and we asked people to say activate. 
and we cut the clip around the word. So we just ask them to say activate, nothing else. And we do it with many people. Then we do the same thing with negative words. We ask them to say kitchen or day or night or refrigerator or uh, football. And we use only a word at a time. So we cut it around the word. And then we write a Python script that takes 10 seconds of background noise, automatically inserts randomly in random positions negative words, and also samples a positive word or two positive words and inserts it at other positions in the audio. Then we use data synthesis method to make it look real. The very interesting piece is that not only you can generate millions of data points like that. So in one day, you can generate millions of combinations of background, positive and negative and sample it. But also because you know where you have inserted the green word, you can label automatically. You don't need to label manually. You know where you inserted it. You can automatically put the labels and the ones in the positions that you inserted. It. This takes you uh, maybe a day and you have tens of millions of data points within a day. So it's very powerful. The one thing that you may argue is even if you, you manage to use uh, uh, synthesis, audio synthesis methods, this will never look real. It will never look perfectly real. And I agree with you, but we can still use that for our training set. For your dev and test set, you still want to label manually. So you want to collect a proper 10 second audio clip with people talking, saying activate, and then you label manually. But fortunately, 99% or 95% of our data is going to the training set and we want a large training set. You can always label manually 100 audio clips to test your model uh, for the test and dev set, which is what we did. And so in, in, a, in, a, in a day or two, you have a pro proper data set to work from uh, with enough accents, with enough uh, uh, um, type of data. And so this is really the trick of these projects. And it's what led the project to be successful. So we're, we're going to end on this slide, but the, the summary of learnings is data collection strategy mattered in this project. We used, again, human experiments to understand what labeling scheme may be more uh, interesting to us. And we also defer to, to, to expert advice where we, where we were asking ourselves, what sample rate am I going to use? We didn't try to spend a week on experiments on sample rate. We said people have done it before. I'm just going to defer to the experts that did it before. Okay. Super. Great. I know we're almost at the top of the hour, so I'm going to uh, to share back the the the, the, the main uh, slides. But but uh, you can test your skills. Many of these case study skills are on workera.ai. Uh, so if you want to test what's your strength and areas for improvement, go for it and choose a a skill set, a pathway that is uh, aligned with your career goals. Um, if you're in a company, ask your manager, what do you think is a good pathway for me? What are the goals that I need to set myself? And what are the, 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 the grades that I want to have? And if you uh, want to deploy that for your team, you can also reach out to us uh, on WorkHera directly on the website. But, uh, uh, but I enjoyed talking to everyone. And so I want to say thank you to the Intelligent Machines team and to Oli for for having me and uh, and I, I would love to take questions and and and, and so let's go thank right you uh, thank you Ken so much uh, uh, I liked how you broke down a complex process into simple steps and make made it interactive for everyone through a few games and a few experiments in in the session now we'll move to the uh, questions session we collected a few questions before the before the webinar and a few uh, from the webinar as well. So I'm going to read it out so that I get it uh, exactly right and put them uh, correctly as they have mentioned. Uh, the first question is from Bushra Mehrin. Uh, she's from uh, Gramin Fund, And she's asking that how market researchers can help in the revolution of an AI powered future? What and why to focus? That is her question and would lo love to get your insights on that. Yeah, thank you for the question. So. Uh, Market researchers, I, I imagine that by, by market uh, research, you, you, you're, you're, you may be talking about uh, doing uh, an analysis of what AI solutions and applications exist in the markets and, uh, and maybe do an analysis for certain types of industries. And the question is, Inam, if I, if I may repeat to make sure I get it right, sure. is uh, 
what level of fluency in AI, literacy in AI uh, can these people have and, and how do they use it on the job? Is that, is that the question? Probably. Right. Uh, so if I may read it again, uh, so how market researchers can help in the revolution of an AI powered future, what and what focus. So that is the exact coding that she did. Okay, okay. Well, market researchers, uh, in my opinion, have uh, a lot of visibility. So the, the research that you will publish will be read by a lot of uh, leaders of companies, it may influence their decisions, it may uh, make a company invest more in a certain topic than another because you've done the research. And so what I would, uh, what I would say is, uh, is uh, it's very important to, to, to be unbiased when you report information about AI. There's a lot of noise in the market. So what, what I personally do is I try to fine tune my antennas to make sure that I'm following the right people, I'm getting access to the right information on Twitter, uh, I'm participating in the right communities on Reddit, uh, I am uh, looking at papers on the right conferences where it's peer reviewed, and I can trust that the reviewers did a good job at defining what works and what doesn't work, even if it's never perfect. And so as market researchers, being able to find the right sources for AI applications is very, very important and it will impact the, the quality of your study. In terms of how uh, uh, market researchers may use AI, I think it, you don't have to use AI all the time, obviously, but if you have a certain amount of data because you've been acquiring a lot of uh, large uh, data points um, uh, and data sets, you can start using uh, uh, clustering methods. You can start using uh, uh, data analysis in order to extract insights from your data. And I would call that data science even more than machine learning. Uh, because you're trying to uh, um, uh, use data in order to inform data-driven decision-making. And that's more of a, a, the realm of data science as opposed to automation. Right. Thank you so much, Kian. Uh, the next question is from Shiraju Muni. Uh, he, uh, he's from Valiant Tech. Uh, so his question is, is there a role for designers who want to work with AI or data science? If so, what should we study? Yeah. Uh, definitely. There, I, I would even consider designers to be in the AI plus X category, where my advice would be you have a great background in design and don't lose it, especially if you're passionate about design. But make sure that you are fluent in design. The same way designers today, if you're talking about UX designers, visual designer, UI designers, IDs, and each of the designers have a different specialty, obviously. But... Uh, uh, but today, a UX designer needs to be fluent in software. Like You cannot talk to a front-end engineer about the requirements if you don't have the background to talk about software and understanding microservices, maybe understanding uh, uh, monolithic approaches to be able to, to talk to the engineer. The same thing happened in AI. I can give you examples of projects where uh, you want to build a product that has positive feedback loops. So part of the strategy to make the product better is to be able to let the user play with the product so that you can understand the behavioral patterns and then improve the experience for the user. This requires a UX designer to be very thoughtful about AI and understand what sort of data points we can use in order to improve the experience for our users. I don't think a UX designer that has a background in AI or fluency and has trained themselves in AI will be as effective as someone who understands data collection, labeling, modeling, and also how the life cycle of an AI project works. Yeah. Fantastic answer. Uh, so the next question is from Shihab. Uh, Shihab is a freshman at IBA University of Dhaka. Uh, so his question is, what are the best possible ways to break into the fields of data science, AI, and machine learning from a business background? Uh, while applying for companies, I found that most internship and entry-level jobs require a technical background. So maybe doing a master's would be a good choice. Uh, what kind of programs would be a good fit then? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good question. And uh, and the journey uh, um, in joining an AI um, uh, team is never easy. So it will require you to work hard. But I think there's several options. Um, the first option is uh, the more technical option is there is a path from business to data analysis. And then there is a path from data analysis or analytics to data scientists, if that's what you want to do. So as a business professional, you probably have good ways of translating data into insights, into business insights. So you can do the tie between those 
from your background understanding the business. It will be beneficial to develop some data analysis skills. So that means understanding common statistical parameters, uh, being able to do some spreadsheet work. Maybe you can work with R, maybe you can work with SQL. You can do a certain level of business analytics in other terms. And that gives you an entry point to certain companies. Uh, and you may be in a situation where you are adjacent to an AI team, where you're supporting functions to translate the data insights into business insights. And then from there, you can start you know, being surrounded by more experts and develop your fluency even more and become a leader where you can make decisions for AI strategies for companies. So that's one option. The other option is, um, is more of the business option or the product option where uh, you have an understanding of the business and you want to delve more into product management or program management or project management uh, because your skill set is well translatable. Uh, I would suggest that you look at programs and I, I will not give you a program specifically in mind because there are so many out there and you may uh, be suited for many of them, uh, but look for programs where uh, there is uh, histories of students that have been able to go from that program into jobs in AI companies. Um, I would not uh, index too much on the company name. So there are certain big companies that have extremely attractive brands, but you end up losing yourself in a team that does not do any interesting work or impactful work or works on a very small feature that is not really used. I would look at the team you join in the company and uh, oftentimes uh, during the interview process, if you ask the right questions, you will be able to identify, are these people working on business critical projects? Because if you're on business critical projects, you will be more resourced. You will have uh, a more of a career plan for growth. And ultimately, your career will likely accelerate. So I would do uh, some of these methods. Right, uh, another fantastic answer. Uh, the, the next question is a little related to the previous question. So Nawazul from Mindscape is asking, uh, those who are in entry, mid or senior level executive or managerial posts from business background, do they also have a career in the AI industry? Um, so I would say there is a difference between career and, and skills. I don't think business executives are looking to become AI people, I don't think they need to, but I think that there is a huge momentum on pushing executives to learn to be fluent and literate in AI. So today, if you're a, a, a technique, like, like the leader, a, a business leader in a tech company, you know software, whether you want it or not, you ask the, the, the business leaders in technical companies, they know about software all around. They can talk about software, they can talk, they can have conversation, they can build strategies about software. They can, many of them cannot build strategies around AI yet. And so the next five, 10 years are going to be focused on making those business executives AI fluent. And if you're ahead of the curve, you're going to benefit for it in your career. But I would not shoot for an AI job unless you want to do a full reinvention of yourself. I would make sure that I'm fluent in AI, that I can build AI strategies and I can join AI companies. So I have the right level of fluency so that when I talk to a company, about AI, I know what data collection is, data strategy is, I know what data regulations are, I know GDPR, I know all the regulations that are present. I, I just am aware and knowledgeable about AI. I think this is the level at which you operate. The reasons uh, this is important for companies is because the, the number one reason why co corporate transformations fail is because of people, is because executives don't have the right mindsets and they don't understand that certain uh, initiatives can lead to a huge improvement over many years. Uh, it takes a lot of vision and a lot of literacy and fluency to be able to look at the steps ahead of time. And so business executives need to acquire those skills. Yeah. Right, uh, another comprehensive answer. So I'll move to the next question. So Aisha from EMK Center is asking, uh, so would it would be grateful if the speaker shares reading materials or certified courses that will help entrepreneurs uh, incorporate data science into business innovatively? Yeah, 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 that's a great question. Uh, so my, my first advice is before choosing a course, uh, make sure you assess yourself. I've seen so many of my students taking a course and then realizing 10 hours in the course that the course is 200 hours, 
the course is too easy or it's too difficult and it's not relevant to what I wanted. So I've, I've lost my time. I've wasted my time. So make sure you know what you need. So uh, that's why we developed assessments at Workera so that you can test yourself, understand I'm that good at machine learning. I'm much better at algorithms. I'm actually pretty good at software. I have a gap in data science, probability and statistics and focus on the right areas and get your personalized learning plan. So that's one thing I would do. The second thing is, as we said earlier, AI is changing very rapidly. There's a lot of novelties that come out. It's important to build your center of information. That's what I call the antennas. Connect your antennas to the right sources. Um, go on Twitter. It's what I use for real-time information about machine learning because researchers are posting a lot of the latest and greatest. You will get a lot of noise on Twitter, uh, but you will also get real-time information. If you're curious of who to follow, uh, look on my Twitter of the list of people I follow and follow them. I've, I've done, a, a, I spend a lot of time trying to find the right people to follow. So you can just borrow that list. Uh, look at who Andrew follows as well. And, and those are usually good people to follow. Reddit uh, is better when you want to delve into deep discussions um, about uh, AI and people are discussing papers. I would not recommend it for someone who's beginning their journey, but once you get uh, to your first few uh, uh, levels on work era, it, then it's, it's very helpful to go on Reddit and participate in the community discussions. Uh, those are some of the things I would advise. I don't have a special resource in mind because I, I want you to be assessing yourself before going toward, but there is a lot of good courses out there. There's just a ton of good content. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Uh, the next question is from Mustavi. Uh, he is studying computer science at North South University. So his question has two parts. Uh, the first part is how to prioritize which papers to read and implement since there seem to be way too many uh, for ML engineering specifically. And the second question is pointers on how to stay engaged in the data science and AI community and collaborate with other practitioners on projects. Yeah. Okay, so for the first part of the question, um, you know, what, how to decide which paper to, to work on or to re-implement. Uh, well, this is a good one because uh, there is papers coming out every day and you will never have time to implement all the papers, obviously. So you have to be very selective. What I typically do is I have a goal in mind. Let's say I wanna, I'm in a job and my job requires me to build uh, an image detector. So an object detector uh, on, a, on a manufacturing line, let's say, or something like that, or maybe, uh, I have a drone and I'm trying to detect certain behaviors. Um, the first thing I would do is if I have a friend who I know has done something similar, I would call my friend and ask my friend, can you give me 10 papers, 20 papers? Can you send me the papers? They're probably busy. So I don't want them to teach me that they just don't have the time, but they can send me resources. So I will tell them, send me 20 papers. Um, uh, um, from there, I would spend five minutes on each paper, not more. I would look at the paper and I would look at the abstract. I would look at the figures and I would look at the conclusion. That's it, nothing else. I would go, go through the 20 papers. By then I will know what are the five papers that are the most interesting to me? Like what are the closest to what I wanna do? I will take those five papers. I will probably spend 30 minutes on those papers. And, um, and, uh, and that time I will go to the second section on development or methodology to understand it better. Uh, after that path, I would know what are the one or two papers that are the most interesting, probably one, and I would spend maybe 10 hours, 20 hours on it. Maybe I will re-implement. That, that, that ensures that I'm working on the right paper across the 20 and that it's bringing something to my project. Uh, if I don't have a friend who's an expert, uh, what I would do is I would search online uh, for large-scale study papers. So let's say I'm looking for a... a generative modeling, I would search generative modeling uh, uh, study paper on, on Google uh, or on whatever search engine you use. And I would uh, open these large scale study papers because they provide a lot of insights over the last few years. And I will quickly skim through them and then identify what, what papers may be more relevant for me to practice on or to implement. Uh, sometimes I will look at the introductions of papers because they, they do a good job at summarizing the current states of the field. And uh, they usually point to seminal paper, which are papers that have been the, the first ones of their kind in certain areas of machine learning or AI. 
uh, those are some of the techniques I would use, but I would not uh, implement every new paper that comes out. Uh, first, because many of them will not work. Uh, and second, because we, we just don't have the time to, to do as much. Right. Uh, uh, Kian's second part of the question was basically how he wants to know how to stay engaged with the DS and AI community and to collaborate with practitioners and prospects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stay engaged. Uh, I would say, as I said, Twitter, Reddit are great places to stay engaged with the community. Um, there is a lot of Slack groups or um, or Discord groups where you can join and find partners. Uh, Workera, for example, has a very big, big Slack group with, I, I forgot the exact number of people, but a lot of practitioners share their projects and, and start working together. Uh, so this is another way to get involved in the community. Um, yeah, I think I think those are those are nice ways to to get involved. Great. Uh, uh, so the final question from the questions that we took before the session is from Fahad Munir. Uh, uh, he's from VCube. He wants to know how to get into more case study based problem solving, as most of the online courses doesn't focus on this. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah, once once you have taken a few courses and you have the foundations of theory. Uh, you really want to get to the practical level and, and find case studies. Uh, in my view, the best way I've seen people do that, uh, and, and, and one I would say on Workera, we try to add as many case study style questions because we know that after a certain level, that's what people like. Um, but, but I think that uh, I would follow a lot of engineering blogs and scientist blogs. So. Um, you go on, on, on the blogs on Medium <clears throat> or other blog platforms of top companies that you like. So if you're an automotive, you know, you look at the work that some of the top automotive companies are doing in AI, you look at their engineering blogs and you read. You read every day. These are great case studies. You read uh, what the engineers are sharing about the decisions they've made when building the system. Same for manufacturing, same for healthcare, same for energy. Uh, and those are great case studies because they come from actual engineers who have built an AI systems and have done enough so that they've been able to write a blog about it and uh, and and tell about the methods they've made. I I actually find that when reading a blog, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, noise in it because they they try to set the context. But the most important to me are the little techniques that they've used. So I've looked uh, I look in the development area and I look oh wow interesting they had an image. And uh, they, they augmented their image data using that method that I had never heard before. Well, now I know about it. Uh, th these are the type of stuff that I look for. These little methods that are blended into the blogs rather than the top headline. It takes a little bit of effort to like go through and read the entire thing, but I find it uh, to be uh, uh, helpful for case study. Right, uh, fantastic answer again. Uh, so Kian, I just wanted to check with you. We have three questions, I think three questions from today's session. Uh, uh, we're checking on you, wh where you on time. Uh, is, are we taking too much of your time? No, we can go through the three okay. questions. No problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, the first question is from uh, Shaikh uh, Zawad Ibrahim. Uh, so he is asking that, hello, Kian, could you, uh, could you discuss the significance of data science applications in early product management days of the company? I see, early product management. So uh, I would say a few things. Um, and that's my personal opinion. So by no means it's, it's the right thing to do. But uh, I find when founding a company that the mindset of AI is very important. But I don't find that it's important to invest heavily in AI resources early on. Um, I think what matters when founding the company is you have in mind what sort of data are you trying to acquire uh, what sort of product are you building? For example, if you're building a smart product, product people that have experience in AI and data, they have a better way of visualizing what the product would look like. They have a better way of understanding uh, we are trying to build that and it will require a recommender system. And I'm confident that we can build that because I've seen something before similar. However, I would say that uh, in recommender system, for example, there is a certain level of data you need before an AI system will beat a rule-based system. And I will not try to build an AI system before you get to that regime of data. So I say, focus on the mindset around data and 
when the time is right, start building the AI team and the AI capabilities. Don't do it too early. Um, so th that, that would be my, my advice for product people who are trying to found projects and found companies is to, is to, is to lay out the path, but don't overinvest in AI until you have, you know, a, a good business, you have product market fit, and you now have everything you need to start building the AI team. Right. That is a really insightful take. Uh, the uh, second last question is from Abzal. Uh, he's from Interjumptions, actually. So how easy or difficult is to switch to an AI uh, carrier from a software engineering background? Yeah, um, great question. Uh, software engineers are lucky uh, for many reasons, but they've done hard work. One is... Um, they have a lot of the foundational skills that a strong machine learning engineer needs. I, I'm not saying data scientists on purpose because I think software engineers uh, have a lot of skills that allow them to become machine learning engineers. Um, um, and so they're in a very good position. My advice though uh, would be <clears throat> not try to be a data scientist. So um, when you look at the AI project development life cycle, you remember we have data engineering, we have modeling, and we have uh, deployment, and we have business analysis, and also AI infrastructure. Um, it turns out that there is a shortage in the industry for all of these tasks across the board. But the shortage is even bigger for data engineering, for deployment, and for AI infrastructure which are three tasks that software engineers are very well suited at solving. So my advice to software engineers is don't try to become data scientists. Try to work with data. Try to work as much with data. Try to build data pipelines. Try to understand the foundations of data engineering. Uh, build up a little bit of your algorithmic skills and prototyping skills. Uh, but very important to keep writing production level code. Because when I look at companies, what they lack is engineers that are able to write production level code uh, uh, for AI teams. And so software engineers are great. But what I would not do is try to learn statistics from scratch or probabilities from scratch. Maybe you've not done it since uh, high school or, or undergrad or, or a long time ago. I would not try to invest too much on that. I would, I would try to retain your strong coding and engineering capabilities, but apply it to AI problems. Right, thank you so much. The last question is actually an anonymous entry. So uh, I am a mechanical engineer with working knowledge of uh, C-sharp. Can you suggest me a pathway of becoming an AI engineer or machine learning engineer? Yeah, so you're an AI plus X practitioner. And so my advice would be uh, go and work your app, look at AI plus X pathway, and we have defined certain areas for you to test in. And once you do the test, you will get feedback. And then you can start strategizing from that feedback, depending on which area you're strongest at or in which biggest gap you have. In my experience, having worked with many mechanical engineers, uh, mechanical engineers are typically extremely strong at linear algebra. So derivatives are probably not a problem for you. Integrals are probably not a problem for you. They're usually good at algorithmic coding because you may have done beyond C sharp, you may have done some MATLAB and you may have done uh, writing a lot of loops, a lot of matrix multiplications, a lot of uh, computational coding. And so when you assess, you will see that you're probably very strong at those areas and you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Instead, the parts that I see mechanical engineers struggling more with is uh, software, software engineering, uh, maybe a little level of, uh, of, um, um, of uh, statistics, depending on the specialty that you had within mechanical engineering. If you worked in quantum, physics, uh, 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 you probably are good at stat as well. If you work in thermodynamics, you're probably good at stats as well. But if you didn't, you may need a refresher. So I would say first assess yourself and then you can strategize after. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Kian. We had a few other questions, but uh, uh, due to the sake of time, we could not uh, take all the questions. Uh, but I, I request Olivai to say a few words uh, and to thank you again uh, on behalf of all the participants and the panelists. Uh, it was a very exciting session, the way you structured the content and answered each of the questions specifically with insights. Uh, we thank you uh, from the bottom of our heart and uh, would love to see you again working with Bangladeshi community and helping our community bloom. Uh, so, Olivier, please, over to you. Oh, thank you, thank you so much, Iram. Thank you a lot, you know, Kian. It's been very early in your place and you know, we have given concrete concepts and, and I, I imagine 
some years from now, there will be 20 more Kians, 20 more, or more Russians from this room who would speak about this event. Um, I would just like to take a minute. Uh, আপনাদেরকে No, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Inam. Thank you, Oli, uh, for, for having me. I, I enjoyed uh, uh, talking to everyone. Thank you very much uh, to everyone who participated on the chat. I think we had a really interactive session, and I'm very happy that people are really quick to answer and have great ideas, so keep it up. Uh, I, I hope to see everyone soon, and, 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 and thank you very much. Thank, thank you a lot, Ken. Hope you have a great thank day. Thank you a lot, Ken. Yeah, bye, bye, take good care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.